Mencius, the only other person in China to have his name commonly Latinized besides Confucius is Mengzi or Mencius, who is thought to have lived from 371 to 289 BC. His father died when he was only three, and his mother was said to have moved from the vicinity of a cemetery and a market to a school because her son imitated their activities. Another story tells how Mencius had walked in on his wife in a private room as she was sitting in an improper way. When Mencius complained, his mother persuaded him not to leave his wife because he had not announced his coming or kept his eyes down when entering. In his one-page biography of Menke, or Mencius, Summa Qian tells us that he was from the state of Tso, studied under a disciple of Tzu Su, the grandson of Confucius, and having mastered the way, went to Qi to serve King Xuan. Mencius also went to Liang, where King Hui found the views of Mencius impractical and remote from reality before he fully listened to them. This was when Qin had enhanced its wealth and military strength by putting Lord Shang in power. Chu and Wei had also won wars by putting Wu Qi in charge of their governments. King Wei and King Xuan made Qi dominant by employing Sun Tzu, Tian Qi, and others. This was the middle of the Warring States period when military alliances were continually being formed and changed in relation to the powerful western state of Qin. Mencius preached the traditional virtues of the three dynasties, but never received a sympathetic hearing. According to the historian, he then retired and with the help of his disciple Wan Zhang and others, wrote the Mencius in seven books and commented on the classical books of odes and documents while developing the ideas of Confucius. The first book of Mencius begins by describing his visit to King Hui of Liang, who ruled from 370 to 319 BC. The aged king assumes that Mencius came a long way because he believed he could profit his state. But Mencius replies that concern for profit is what imperils a state. All that matters is what is good and right. King Hui says he has worked hard in governing and asks why his population has not increased. Mencius tells him that he is too fond of war. If he does not interfere with the busy seasons in the fields, then the people will have more grain to eat. If he does not allow nets with too fine a mesh to be used in the large ponds, there will be more fish to eat. If the cutting down of trees with axes is limited, there will be enough timber. By caring for education in village schools and teaching proper human relationships, humans will respect each other and their king. But failing to garner surplus food or distribute it when people are starving, saying it is the fault of the harvest, is like killing a man and blaming it on the weapon. Good government reduces punishment and taxation, gets the people to plow deeply and weed promptly, and helps the able to learn. King Liang asked Mencius how the empire could be settled, and he replied that one who was not fond of killing could unite it. But among the shepherds of people at that time, there was not one doing so. Mencius said that King Hui could become a true king by bringing peace to the people, but he is failing because he does not practice kindness. It is not that he lacks the ability, but he has refused to act in the proper way. Mencius knew that the king wanted to extend his territory, rule over the central kingdoms, and bring peace to the barbarians on the borders. But his way of going about it is like looking for a fish by climbing a tree. Not only is it unlikely he will find it, but in his case it is worse because his way causes disaster as well. If he practiced good government, the office seekers would want to be in his court, the farmer till his land, the merchants use his marketplace, the travelers go by his roads, and all those who hate their rulers would come to him with their complaints. Mencius said that only a gentleman can keep a constant heart the people tend to lose constancy and go astray, falling into excesses. To punish them is like setting a trap for them. A bright ruler makes sure they have what they need before he drives them toward the good. Thus, it is easy for them to follow him. 
To accomplish this, he must go back to the fundamentals of nurturing the people's needs and providing education. When King Hui died, his successor seemed to Mencius to lack dignity, and so he went to advise Xuan, who had become king of Qi in 320 BC. Mencius suggested that King Xuan share his enjoyments with his people, for when a king's park is open to the people, they consider it small, but when they are prohibited from entering it, they naturally think it is too large. King Xuan asked how to promote good relations with other states. And Mencius said that by submitting to a state smaller than his, one delights in heaven and enjoys possession of the empire. And in submitting to a state larger, one is in awe of heaven and enjoys possession of one's own state. Mencius tells how Duke Jing followed wise advice and opened his granaries for the poor. Another ruler cared for the aged and orphans. Although King Xuan said these things were well spoken, he could not put them into practice because he loved money and women. When Mencius asked the king what should be done if someone entrusted his wife and family to the care of a friend and they were allowed to suffer cold and hunger, the king said he would break with his friend. And if the marshal of the guards could not control his guards, he would, should be replaced. Yet, when Memphis asked what should be done if the whole realm is ill-governed, the king turned to his attendants and changed the subject. And Men Mencius advised that when the attendants all give the same recommendation and the counselors and everyone else does also, it still should be investigated to see if what they say is true. In this way, good and wise men may be appointed and unsuitable officers removed. King Xuan asked if regicide is permitted, since Shang founder Tong banished Jia and King Wu marched against the last Shang king. But Mencius responded that these rulers so mutilated humanity that they should be called outcasts, not kings. In 315 BC, the king of Yen abdicated and appointed his prime minister, causing a revolt in Yen. Mencius asked if it was all right to march on Yen. He was asked if it was all right to march on Yen. And he said, yes, because the king had no right to give Yen to another. But he explained that he was not encouraging Qi to invade Yen because only a heaven-appointed officer had the right to do so. After Qi invaded Yen, King Xuan asked Mencius if he should annex Yen. Mencius said that if annexing it could please its people, then it could be done. But if annexing it antagonized its people, then he should not. Qi annexed Yen, and most of the feudal lords planned to aid Yen. King Xuan asked Mencius how he should meet the threat. Mencius refers to the example of Tang, founder of the Shang dynasty, and then gives the following advice. Now, when, when you went to punish Yen, which practiced tyranny over its people, the people thought you were going to rescue them from water and fire. And they came to meet the army, bringing baskets of rice and bottles of drink. How can it be right for you to kill the old and bind the young, destroy the ancestral temples, and appropriate the valuable vessels? Even before this, the whole empire was afraid of the power of Qi. Now you double your territory without practicing good government. This is to provoke the armies of the whole empire. If you hasten to order the release of the captives, old and young, leave the valuable vessels where they are, and take your army out after setting up a ruler in consultation with the men of Yen, it is still not too late to halt the armies of the empire. Mencius later explained that he never intended to stay long in Qi, but he was unable to leave because the war broke out. Duke Mu of Tso asked Mencius what he should do after 33 of his officers died without the people helping them. Mencius recalled that in the years of bad harvest, nearly a thousand of his people had suffered in, in spite of full granaries because his officials had not informed him of what was happening. Zheng Su's warning that what you meet out will be, back, will be paid back to you came to pass. Mencius said the duke should not hold a grudge against the people 
because if he practices good government, they will love their superiors and even die for them. Mencius advised Duke Wen of the small state of Ting to do good and hope that heaven will grant success. In starting an enterprise, a gentleman can only leave behind a tradition that can be carried on. He cited the case of a leader of Bin who told his people that the D tribes wanted their land. And so rather than bring them harm, bring harm to them, he was leaving. The people of Bin realized that he was a good man and flocked after him as if to market. Others decided to stay and defend their land. These were the two choices. Mencius declared that the appearance of a true king was never more overdue than in his time when the people suffered under such tyrannical governments. He did not just admire the ancients. He believed that twice as much could be done in his time with half the effort. For Mencius, ethical good was at the center of the vital force in the human body called chi. The will directs this energy, and when it nourishes it with integrity, the chi unites what is right and the way. He recommended a middle path between too much meddling and negligence. He told of a man who urged his rice plants to grow by pulling them out too soon. The other extreme is not even bothering to weed. Mencius could read character from one's words. He could see the blind in their biased words, the ensnared in their immoderate words, those who have strayed in their heretical words, and those at their wit's end in their evasive words. Along with the legendary sages Po Yi and Yi Yin, he admired Confucius most of all. They were capable of winning the homage of the feudal lords, but if they had to kill one innocent person in order to gain the empire, none of them would have consented to do so. People only submit to force unwillingly because they are not strong enough to resist. But when they submit to the transforming influence of ethics, they do so sincerely with admiration in their hearts. Goodness brings honor, but cruelty disgrace. When the good and wise rule, the able are employed. In times of peace, the laws can be explained to the people, but the ruler indulging in pleasures and indolence courts disaster. If the good and wise are honored and the able are employed, gentlemen will come to the court. If goods are exempted from taxation in the marketplace, and premises are exempted from land taxes, traders will come. If there is no fee at border stations, travelers will come. If tillers pay no land tax but help in the public fields, farmers will come. Mencius believed that no one is devoid of a heart sensitive to the suffering of others and uses the example of a baby about to fall into a well. Anyone will naturally be moved by compassion to prevent the tragedy not to get into the good graces of the parents, nor to win praise, nor because one dislikes to hear a child cry. Whoever is devoid of a heart of compassion and shame and right, and right or wrong is not human. From this heart comes the good, duty, courtesy, propriety, and wisdom. Anyone lacking these is a slave. Practicing the good is like archery, when one fails to hit the mark, one must correct oneself. If others do not respond to your love, look into your own humanity. If others fail to respond to your governing, consider your own wisdom. If others do not return your courtesy, look into your own respect. In other words, whenever you fail to achieve your purpose, look into yourself. The best person, like the great Shun, is not afraid to learn from others, and after doing good oneself, goes on to help others do good. Mencius believed that the good and talented ought to help those who are less so. Only one who will not do some things is capable of doing great things. He warned people to think of the consequences before pointing out the shortcomings of others. Doing what is right was paramount for Mencius as he believed that a great person might not always keep one's word or see actions through to the end if these were not right. A superior person finds the way in oneself, is at ease with it, and draws deeply from it, finding its source wherever one turns. Those who follow the way have many supporters. Those who do not 
have few. At court, rank is exalted, and in the village, age is respected. But for assisting the world and governing people, virtue is best. Mencius accused the governor of Ping Lu of refusing to report to duty several times because he allowed his people to starve during a famine. Mencius recommended that if farmers help each other to keep watch and nurse each other in illness, they will live in love and harmony. The way cannot be bent to please others. No one has ever straightened others by bending oneself. Mencius mentions that the current teachings in the empire are those of Yang Ju and Mo. Yang Ju taught everyone for, him, for oneself, and Mo advocated love without making any preference for family, which Mencius felt was no better than beasts. Mencius believed that love of one's parents was the first step which could lead to peace in the empire. Pleasing one's parents begins by being true to oneself, which depends on understanding goodness. By pleasing one's parents, one can win the trust of friends, the confidence of superiors, and thus govern the people. Mencius referred to Confucius criticizing John Chu for agreeing to raise taxes. How much more would he reject those who wage war on behalf of rulers to gain land and fill the plains with the dead? This Mencius called showing the land how to devour human flesh. For Mencius, a great person retains the heart of a child. He felt that even goodness could not be used to dominate people. One can only succeed by using goodness for the welfare of the people, and one can never gain the empire without their heartfelt admiration. The good retain their hearts and love others, and the courteous respect others. Sages may live in retirement or in the world, but they always keep their integrity intact. The heart of compassion is good. The heart of shame is dutiful. The heart of respect, appropriate. And the heart of right and wrong, wise. Mencius says, seek and you will find it. Let go and you will lose it. People become different because of what ensnares their hearts. The sage is merely the one who discovers what is right and reasonable in the heart. Mencius observed that once the trees had been luxuriant on Ox Mountain, but being near a city, they were constantly lopped by axes. With rain and dew, new shoots came out, but then cattle and sheep grazed upon the mountain, leaving it bald. Is this the nature of the mountain, he asks? Similarly, humans lose their true hearts, just as the trees were lopped off day by day. Humans rest at night, but each day dissipates what has been gained. When what was original is no longer preserved, they become like animals. Anything will grow with the right nourishment, but without it, anything will wither away. Goodness is the heart, and rightness the correct road. When the heart strays, people often fail to go after it, yet when chickens stray, they will retrieve them. For Mencius, the sole concern of learning is to go after this strayed heart. People love all the parts of their person. However, the small person harms the more important in seeking what is less valuable, while the great person nourishes the parts of greater importance. The heart can think and tell the difference. This is what heaven has given humans. But if one does not think, one will not find the answer. Mencius compares goodness to water which can overcome the cruelty of fire. Some try to put out a cartload of burning wood with a cup of water and then say water cannot overcome fire. To do this is to place on one side, place one on the side of the most cruel. In the end, they perish. The way is like a broad road that is not difficult to find. The problem is that people simply do not look for it. Those who do look for it will find enough teachers. Once Mencius met a man who was going to chew to persuade them that war was unprofitable. Mencius commended his purpose, but suggested that by putting profit first, ethics may be excluded, and the result will be chaos. By placing the ethics of what is best for all before them, all relationships can be made mutually beneficial. 
Mencius explained how morality had degenerated from the three ancient emperors to the five protectors of the feudal lords to the current feudal lords and their counselors, each of which offended against those who came before. <clears throat> the emperor used to inspect the domain, and the feudal lords reported on their duties. Those who needed it were given aid. In the feudal system, lords were rewarded with land. If the land was neglected, the good and wise overlooked, and grasping men put in power, then the Lord was reprimanded. Thus the emperor punished but did not attack, while the feudal lords attack but do not punish. The protectors then intim intimidated the feudal lords to attack other feudal lords. The most illustrious of the protectors, Duke Kuan of Qi, got the feudal lords to agree to a pledge which included first not punishing dutiful sons nor putting aside heirs, nor elevating concubines. Second, honoring the good and wise and training the capable. Third, respecting the aged and being kind to the young, guests and travelers. Fourth, not making offices hereditary, nor letting one man hold more than one office, nor allowing a feudal lord to execute a counselor solely on his own authority. And fifth, not allowing diversion of dikes, nor prohibiting the sale of rice. Today, says Mencius, the feudal lords violate all of these five injunctions. Yet Mencius concludes that the crime of encouraging a ruler to evil deeds is small compared to the pandering to his unspoken evil desires. Thus the counselors of the time offend against the feudal lords. Mencius held that a good person would not even take from one person to give to another, let alone seek territory at the cost of human lives. To enrich a ruler who is neither attracted to the way nor good to the people is like enriching a tyrant. When about to place a great responsibility on a person, heaven may test one with hardship and frustrated efforts in order to toughen one's nature and shore up deficiencies. People usually only mend their ways after making mistakes. Those whose minds are frustrated learn how to innovate. Mencius believed that those who understand their own nature will know heaven. By retaining the heart and nurturing their nature, they serve heaven. He found no greater joy than finding upon self-examination that he is being true to himself. He taught the golden rule of trying your best to treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself as the shortest path to goodness. The best person does not abandon what is right in adversity nor depart from the way in success. In obscurity, one can perfect one's own person. In prominence, one can perfect the whole empire as well. For Mencius, good government was not as important as good education, because the people fear good government, but they love good education. Because, excuse me, good government wins their wealth, but good education wins their hearts. Mencius believed that contrary to goodness to kill even one person and contrary to justice to take what is not w entitled to, what one is not entitled to. The wise person knows everything but considers urgent only what demands attention. The good person loves everyone but devotes oneself in close association with the good and wise. Mencius pointed out how Du Kui of Liang extended his ruthlessness from those he did not love to those he did by sending to war even the young men he loved, whereas a good person extends one's love to those one did not love. Mencius could find no just wars in the spring and autumn era, but only peers trying to punish one another by war. He considered those who thought of themselves as military experts as grave criminals. The trouble with people, he thought, was that they leave their own fields to weed others' fields, being exacting towards others, but indulgent toward themselves. Like the sages of India, he recommended nurturing the heart by reducing the number of one's desires. Shunzi. Shunzi was born about 310 BC in the state of Zhao, but at the age of 15, he went to study in a center of learning in the state of Qi. There, Shen Tzu probably wrote his books criticizing the ideas of Shen Pu Hai, Shen Dao, Chuang Tzu, Mo Tzu, 
and the rectifying thesis aimed at the logicians. After Qi attacked and absorbed the state of Sung in 286 BC, Shun Tzu tried to persuade King Min and the Lord of Meng Chang that their policies were excessive and would lead to doom if they persisted in them. The Lord of Meng Chang turned against King Min, and Qi was invaded by the armies of Yen, Qin, Wei, and Zhao in 284. The scholars of the academy and Qi had to flee. Shun Tzu went to the southern state of Chu, which was suffering under the domination of the powerful Qin state. As Qin took over portions of Chu, Shun Tzu learned that power must be tempered with justice, and his writings there emphasize education. After about eight years in Chu, Shun Tzu returned to the academy in Qi, where he became the most honored scholar. Shun Tzu's writing in this period seems to have been influenced by Taoism, though he criticizes some of Lao Tzu's ideas. About 265 BC, Shun Tzu was slandered and began to travel to other courts such as Qin and Zhao to give advice as a scholar, though he was never allowed to govern. Shun Tzu left Qin when he was about 50. About a year after Qin's devastating defeat of Shun Tzu's native Zhao in 260, in which 400,000 soldiers were buried alive, Shun Tzu had a discussion with the Lord of Lin Wu in the presence of King Xiao Cheng of Zhao. Shun Tzu argued that what was most important is winning the support of the people so that they can be unified. He claimed that military deception is of no use against a good person and a state that is not torn apart. He observed that Qin used a system of rewards and punishments to build up their strength and expand their territory with repeated victories in the last four generations. Shun Tzu believed that people are deceived by using such military means and profit motivations, while the way to unite them is by principles of propriety and moral education. When deception meets deception, the battle may, be, may go either way, but when deception meets unity, unity is sure to win. Shun Tzu recommended practical arts of regulating military commands through authority, consistent and appropriate rewards and punishments, alert troop movements, complete reports on the enemy, and proceeding in battle only on the basis of thorough understanding. The five expedients of not worrying about one's rank, not pressing too hard for victory, not being too stern with the men nor despising the enemy, not thinking only of gain but of loss as well, and using supplies liberally. The general may refuse to obey the command of his ruler if he is told to take up an untenable position, attack without hope of victory, or deceive the common people. The king's army should not kill old men and boys, nor destroy crops, nor seize those who retire without a fight. But it does not forgive those who resist. It does not punish the common people, but those who lead them astray. A true king, according to Shun Tzu, does not make war, but carries out punitive expeditions. He does not lay siege to a guarded city, nor attack soldiers who resist strongly. He does not massacre a city, nor move his army in secret. And he does not keep his soldiers in the field for more than one season. When the king asked him why a good man would take up arms at all, if it is only to contend, contend for spoil, Shun Tzu replied that a good person loves others and hates to see men do them harm. He only takes up arms to put an end to violence and to do away with harm, not to contend for spoil. Li Su, who studied with Shun Tzu and later became prime minister for Qin and helped to establish its empire, said to Shun Tzu that Qin won victories not by goodness and justice, but by taking advantage of opportunities. Shun Tzu responded that Qin lives in terror and apprehension lest the rest of the world unite to defeat them. This superficial model is the way to bring disorder to the world in a degenerate age. Shun Tzu summarized his policies this way. Lead the people by magnifying the sound of virtue. Guide them by making clear ritual principles. Love them with the utmost loyalty and good faith. Give them a place in the government by honoring the worthy and employing the able, and elevate them in rank by bestowing titles and rewards. Demand labor of them only at the proper season 
lighten their burdens, unify them in harmony, nourish them and care for them as you would little children. Then, when the commands of government have been fixed and the customs of the people unified, if there should be those who depart from the customary ways and refuse to obey their superiors, the common people will, as one man, turn upon them with hatred and regard them with loathing, like an evil force that must be exorcised. Then, and only then, should you think of applying penalties. Shinsu explained how a neighboring state may be annexed by virtue, by force, or by wealth. In using virtue, the customs of the people are respected so that the people follow willingly, and power is increased. But using force wastes strength on military means and weakens the state, while using wealth depletes the material resources of the state. He pointed out that Qi annexed Sung, but could not hold on to it, as Wei took it over. Yen managed to annex Qi, but lost it to Tian Dan, the Qi general. Part of Han joined, joined Zhao, but Qin took it away. Shun Tzu arrived at the court of Zhao just after the Lord of Ping Yuan State had been rescued by the Lord of Xin Ling and his army from Wei, and also an army from Chu, in a defeat of Qin that delayed for 30 years their conquest of the empire. The prime minister of Chu, the Lord of Junxin, appointed Shun Tzu magistrate of Lan Ling, but was persuaded to remove the philosopher from office because of the fear that his good government would lead to a mandate from, he from heaven for him to rule larger areas, threatening the Lord of Chinchen's own power. However, another rhetorician convinced this prime minister that he should ask Shun Tzu to return to his post because he is one of the worthiest men in the world. In reply, Shun Tzu sent a letter saying that a leper pities a king because a ruler who has robbed and murdered suffers mental anguish, while a leper suffers only physically. Shin Tzu composed a poem complaining of one who considers the blind clear-sighted, the deaf keen of hearing, and who considers danger security, asking finally, why did I ever have anything in common with him? Nevertheless, Chun Shen invited him to return once more, and Shun Tzu took up his post in Lan Ling until Chun Shen was assassinated in 238 BC. His two most famous students, Li Su and Han Fei Tzu, that had, him, had left him by then. Li Su sought an office in Qin in 247, and Han Fei Tzu soon after went to present his views to the king in Qin, where he died in 233 BC. Li Su persuaded the king of Qin not to banish all foreigners, and after Qin conquered all of China by 221 BC, became a high minister by 219 and chancellor by 213 BC. Li Su offered his old teacher a nominal position, but Shun Tzu was now in his 90s. Foreseeing that he would fall into unfathomable disasters, Shun Tzu declined the position and died in his late 90s. Shun Tzu's book is organized into discourses on various topics with some poetry. He begins by encouraging learning, which the gentleman says should never cease. By studying widely and examining oneself, wisdom becomes clear, and conduct can be without fault. For Shun Tzu, there is nothing more spiritual than transforming oneself with the way. The gentleman is not different by birth, but knows how to make use of things as a traveler uses carriages and horses or a boat to cross rivers. Everything has a cause, and human glory or shame is nothing but reflection of one's virtue. When one is careless and lazy and forgets oneself, disaster occurs. Evil and corruption invite the anger of others. Virtue can be created by piling up good deeds, and then spiritual understanding will come of itself. Achievement results from never giving up. Shun Tzu's learning program begins with the classics of history, poetry, and the annals, and ends with the books of propriety. The learning of the best is manifest in action, but what the small people hear comes right out the mouth. It is best to associate with the learned and love them. Shun Tzu warns against speaking to the gross or arguing with the contentious, but the way may be discussed with a respectful person and its principles with a reasonable person. The best person trains oneself to see, hear, and think only what is right 
even more than the objects of the senses. The best are not subverted by power or the love of profit, nor swayed by the masses or the world. Through constancy and virtue, one can order oneself and then respond to others. Shunsa emphasized self-improvement. Whoever censures you is your teacher. Whoever approves you is your friend. But whoever flatters you is your enemy. Clinging to profit and turning aside from what is right, Shunsu called depravity. If your will is well disciplined, you may hold up your head before wealth and eminence. A person of breeding loves the law and puts it into effect. A gentleman has a firm will and embodies it in conduct. A sage has keen insight that never fails. If you treat old people well and do not press the already hard-pressed and do good in secret and seek no reward for kindness, both sages and unworthy people will be with you. And would heaven leave such a person to perish? Though poor and hard-pressed, the gentleman is benevolent. Though rich and eminent, he is respectful. Though at ease, he is not indolent. Though weary, he still values good form. He does not take away too much in anger, nor give too much in joy. Shinsa contrasted the gentleman and the petty person. When the gentleman is courageous, he reveres heaven and follows its way. When faint-hearted, he follows moral duty. When knowledgeable, he understands the interconnections of phenomena. When ignorant, he is honest, diligent, and follows a model. When followed, he restrains himself with respect. When not followed, he regulates himself. When he is happy, he harmonizes with others. When sad, he maintains inner peace. When successful, he maintains good form. When encountering hardship, he is frugal and careful. When courageous, the petty person is indolent and haughty. When faint-hearted, lecherous and subversive. When knowledgeable, predatory and clandestine. When ignorant, malicious and rebellious. When followed, imperious. When not followed, resentful and underhanded. When happy, frivolous. When sad, despondent. When successful, proud and unfair. And when encountering hardship, negligent and lazy. Shinsu described how a person may nurture one's mind with truthfulness, uphold the principle of humanity, and behave with justice. Thus, giving humanity form, it produces transmutation in accord with natural order. But those who lack truthfulness will not be individuals. Their characters will not be given form, and the common people will never follow them unless with suspicion. The wise, through truthfulness, may transmute the people, but without it, fathers and sons drift apart and rulers are considered base. Shinsa delineated six productions. Public spirit produces clear understanding, but partisanship produces obscurity. Straightforward diligence produces success, but deceit produces obstructions. Honesty produces perspicacity, but boasting produces self-delusion. Like the Epicureans, Shinsa found that the desirable may also bring what is detestable, and what is beneficial may eventually involve harm. Therefore, one must maturely calculate the relative merits and liabilities in choosing. Human calamities tend to result from prejudices. For Shinsa, the courage of the gentleman is staying with what is just, not being swayed by the exigencies of the moment, not looking for one's own profit, considering the interests of the whole state and assisting in realizing them and weighing the threat of death by upholding moral duty. Shinsa wrote that Motsu knew how to elevate merit and utility, frugality and economy, but he ignored gradations of rank and status, which Shinsu considered essential to social order. He also criticized those who followed Tsusu and Mencius as deluded. Shinsu believed that one may develop inner power, virtue, by not using honor to be arrogant, nor intelligence to place others in difficulty, nor intellect to gain precedence over others, nor courage to cause injury. When not knowing, ask others. When lacking ability, study. And even when having ability, yield to others. 
For since the learning means not only understanding, but carrying it out in action, the wise base their conduct on goodness and justice, making one's speech accord with action. In governing, Shinsu recommended promoting the worthy, dismissing the incompetent, punishing the incorrigibly evil, and teaching the average people. Proposals ought to be weighed in terms of justice and harmoniousness, but to show favoritism and partisan feeling is the worst thing one can do. Shinsu believed that if everyone is treated equally, conflict will result from insufficient goods. Distinctions were set up so that those above could watch over those below. But he did not seem to rationalize this with the principle of justice. Nevertheless, he believed that the common people should be treated with kindness by capable governors, encouraging filial piety and brotherly affection by looking after orphans and widows and assisting the poor. When this is done, the gentlemen may occupy their positions in safety. However, if the state's coffers are heaped up while the people are impoverished, the state will not be able to protect itself at home nor fight its enemies abroad. A king works to acquire people a dictator to acquire allies, and a despot to acquire territory. The militarist who uses might to conquer cities inflicts great injury on people in other states who will want to fight him. But he also harms his own people who will hate him and will not want to fight for him. Thus he lives in constant peril. Shinsu did not believe that secrecy was beneficial to the way of the ruler. Because the superior should elucidate the standard, be correct, diligent, impartial, and honest. Shinsu warns against cutting down trees and injuring plants and fishing in the lakes at the wrong time, lest life be destroyed and growing things be injured. Foreseeing an ecological vision, he concluded that the wise found every move on unity. Those who choose well control others, but those who choose badly will be controlled by others. Shinsa held that war is caused by desire for fame or territory or by anger, but a good ruler may gain fame or territory without fighting, and no one is angry with him. The wicked arise because the rulers do not honor justice. The just person is in accord with people inwardly and things outwardly at peace with those above and in harmony with the people below. Perhaps influenced by the mysticism of Lao Tzu, Shin Tzu saw the work of heaven as bringing to completion without acting and obtaining without seeking. When the work of heaven is established, then the human form is whole and one's spirit is born, resulting in the emotions of love and hate, delight and anger, sorrow and joy. The heart dwells in the center and governs the five senses. The wise cherish heavenly nourishment, obey heavenly dictates, nourish heavenly emotions, understanding what is to be done and what is not to be done. The gentleman does not stop, stop acting because the petty carp and clamor any more than heaven suspends winter because people dislike cold. The gentleman focuses on what is in his power living in the present and remembering the past, refined in purpose, rich in virtuous action, and clear in understanding. The petty put aside their own power and long for heaven's power. Shinsu was skeptical of heavenly portents, fearing rather human portents, such as poor plowing, bad weeding, and evil government. To set aside human concerns and long for what belongs to heaven is to mistake the nature of all things. Shinsa considered ceremonies as markers of the way to guide the people. Shinsa offered this succinct critique to some other of some other philosophers. Shinsa could see the advantages of holding back, but not the advantages of taking the lead. Lao Tzu could see the advantages of humbling oneself, but not the advantages of raising one's station. Mo Tzu could see the advantages of uniformity, but not those of diversity. Sung Tzu could see the advantages of having few desires, but not of having many. If everyone holds back and no one takes the lead, then there will be no gate for advance to advancement for the people. If everyone humbles himself and no one tries to improve his station, then distinctions between eminent and humble become meaningless. If there is only uniformity and no diversity, then the commands of government can never be carried out. 
If there is a lessening of desires and never an increase, then there will be no way to educate and transform the people. Shun Tzu placed great importance on Li, propriety, ceremonies, ritual. He explained that the ancients found that desires led to conflict and disorder if they were not regulated by principles of propriety and justice. He believed that social distinctions need to be made between the eminent and humble, elder and younger, rich and poor, and the important and unimportant. The wise know how to think and be steadfast, but he also felt that they have a love of ritual. Both the outer form and inner meaning must be considered along with the inner feelings and outer practical use. A gentleman would be ashamed to treat even a slave in a way that offends the heart. He wrote, rights trim what is too long and stretch out what is too short. Eliminate surplus and repair deficiency. Extend the forms of love and reverence and step by step bring to fulfillment the beauties of proper conduct. Shunsa also loved music, which he called joy. Negative music, he felt, could be a source of danger and disgrace. The wise kings found joy in proper music because it could make the hearts of people good by deeply influencing them and reforming their ways. Shunsa was concerned that people became, become obsessed by a small corner of truth and fail to comprehend its overall principles. He believed that people sincerely seek what is proper, but they are led astray by their prejudices and bad habits. He criticized Motsu for being obsessed by utilitarian considerations, Shen Pu Hai for being obsessed by the power of circumstance, and Chuang Tzu for being obsessed by thoughts of heaven. Utilitarian considerations make the way wholly a matter of material profit. Thinking only of circumstance makes it wholly a matter of expedience, and thinking only of heaven makes the way wholly a matter of harmonizing with natural forces. However, he considered Confucius good, wise, and free of obsession. People understand the way by using the mind to understand through its emptiness, unity, and stillness. Yet the mind also store things, stores things up, is diversified and constantly moving. The intellect can use memory, which does not hinder new impressions. The mind is the ruler of the body and the master of its intelligence. By its own will, it prohibits or permits, rejects or accepts, goes or stops. The mind decides what is right. In a time of much logical debate, Shinsa attempted to rectify names by defining his terms. What comes from birth he called nature. Likes and dislikes, delights and angers, griefs and joys of nature he called emotions. When emotions arise, the mind makes a choice among them through thought. Applied decisions he called conscious activity. Action based on profit is business, and action based on duty is moral conduct. Knowledge that is applied practically is called ability. Injuries to one's nature are sickness, and unforeseen occurrences are fate. Clarifying terms so that they correspond to reality, he considered essential to social order. Because he believed that everyone does what they think is good and rejects what they think is bad, anyone who understands the way will abide by it. Anyone who would exchange the desires of countless years for a momentary gratification simply cannot do arithmetic. Those who endanger their bodies, afflict their minds, and behave recklessly when they want health, joy, and honor have allowed the self to become the slave of things. The main difference Shinsu had with Mencius was that he believed that human nature is evil and that goodness is the result of conscious activity. Desire for profit comes from the nature of the emotions, but one can be transformed by instruction from a teacher and guidance by propriety. Courtesy and humility are contrary to the emotional nature and must be learned by conscious action. Thus, the wise transform their nature by conscious activity to set up ritual principles and regulations. Shinsa feared that if the authority of the ruler was eliminated so that the order of ritual principles and laws and standards with their punishments were rejected, then the powerful would exploit the weak, the many would terrorize the few, and the whole world would become chaotic and mutually destructive. 
Nevertheless, he believed that everyone could understand goodness, justice, and ritual principles and put them into practice if one associates with good people and is properly taught. In one of his poems, Shinsu lamented that the world is not well ordered. The military is prom promoted in the name of military preparedness. Those who follow the way and its virtue are slandered by many. The humane are degraded and reduced to poverty, while proud and violent men usurp and tyrannize at will. Shinsu believed that when a country is about to flourish, it is certain to value its teachers and give great importance to education, and its laws and standards will be preserved. But when it is on the verge of decay, teachers are treated with contempt, the people are smugly self-satisfied, and the laws and standards will be allowed to go to ruin. In the final eulogy at the end of Shinsu's book, a commentator explains that Shinsu had a harder time than Confucius because he was oppressed by a chaotic age that was intimidated by threats of stern punishment as rulers faced the aggression of Qin. Ritual and moral principles were not observed. The humane were degraded and constrained or ridiculed and derided. And transforming effects of teaching were not brought to completion later Confucian works. In addition to the five ancient Confucian classics from the fourth to the first centuries BC, many shorter Confucian writings were collected together in the Li Qi, which became the most important classic of Li, propriety or rights. In addition to the Analects of Confucius, Lun Yu, and the books of Mencius and Shinsu, another minor Confucian classic was the book of filial piety, Xiao Jing, which was traditionally ascribed to Tseng Tzu the disciple of Confucius who emphasized this virtue. However, scholars believe it was compiled from Confucian teachings in the same period when the Li Qi was being formed. The Xiao Jing consists of conversations between Confucius himself and Tseng Tzu. In this text, filial piety, Xiao, is heralded as the basis of virtue and the source of culture. Confucius explains that since all of our bodies are given to us by our parents, Filial piety should make sure that no harm comes to our parents. This loyalty begins with the parents but moves on to service of the sovereign and is completed by the establishment of one's own personality. From our parents we learn how to love, and one who loves one's parents does not dare to hate others. Love and reverence in service to one's parents gives one a moral influence that transforms people and becomes a model for all. The filial feudal lord is not proud and arrogant, but frugal and prudent in order to keep his wealth and dignity. Filial officers do not presume to use words or act contrary to the early kings. Filial scholars have equal love for their mothers and fathers and their prince. They show love to their mothers, reverence to their prince, and both to their fathers. The common people are filial by supporting their parents through using the soil of the earth and being prudent and frugal in their expenditures. Government by filial piety means not neglecting the ministers of small states, nor ignoring widows, nor mistreating servants and concubines, much less the aristocrats, scholars, people, wives, and children. No bond is greater than the life parents give one. No kindness is greater than their care for the children in their upbringing. Thus filial piety loves one's parents before all by revering them, making them happy, taking care of them in sickness, showing sorrow over their death, and sacrificing to them solemnly. Whoever really loves one's parents will not be proud in a high position, nor rebellious in an inferior position, nor contentious with the people. Another duty is for the son to admonish the parents even if it means disobedience. In case of gross wrong, the son should admonish the father just as the minister should admonish his sovereign and the friend admonish a scholar. If ministers admon admonish the ruler, a state will not be lost even if the ruler is not virtuous. Three books of ritual served as the Li Qing, ritual classic. The oldest is the Yi Li, which was discussed in the previous lecture. The Zhou rituals, the Zhou Li, is ascribed to the famous Duke of Zhou, but scholars believe it was a work of the 5th or 4th centuries BC, although some believe it was entirely forged by Han scholars. 
The six parts of the Zhou Li describe what came to be the six departments of Chinese government for the next 2,000 years. The Institute of Heaven is the prime ministry that supervises all government activities and appoints all the officials. The Institute of Earth covers education and social welfare, especially agriculture and marriage. The Institute of Spring is concerned with ceremonies and protocol, including divination and astrology. The Institute of Summer manages defense and security, training the troops. The Institute of Autumn is the Department of Justice and Punishment, administering the laws. The last section of the book on the Institute of Winter was lost, but was replaced by the Record of the Inspection of Works on the Department of Public Works and Economic Production. The collection of texts known as the Lichi was composed by the followers of Confucius and became an important compendium of Confucian teachings by the first century BC when it was compiled by Dai De and his nephew Dai Sheng. The, the rules of propriety are discussed in detail for funeral rites and mourning, sacrifices, archery, and chariot driving contests, capping ceremonies for the initiation into adulthood, marriage ceremonies, audiences, drinking and banqueting festivities, and friendly missions. The Lichi begins with the following summary of the rules of propriety. Always and in everything let there be reverence, and with the deportment grave as when one is thinking, and with speech composed and definite. This will make the people tranquil. Pride should not be allowed to grow. The desires should not be indulged. The will should not be gratified to the full. Pleasure should not be carried to excess. Men of talents and virtue can become familiar with others and yet respect them, can stand in awe of others and yet love them. They love others and yet acknowledge the evil that is in them. They accumulate and yet are able to part with it. They rest in what gives them satisfaction and yet can seek satisfaction elsewhere. When you find wealth within your reach, do not get it by improper means. When you meet with calamity, do not escape from it by improper means. Do not seek for victory in small contentions. Do not seek for more than your proper share. Do not positively affirm what you have doubts about, and do not let what you say appear as your own view. What is right for the time and circumstances should be followed. In admission to another state, its customs are to be observed. One should not try to please others in an improper way, nor be lavish with one's words. Good conduct is when one cultivates one's own person and fulfills one's words in accordance with the right course. Virtue, goodness, and justice cannot be fully carried out without the rules of propriety, nor can training and lessons be complete, quarrels cleared up, duties between ruler and minister, high and low, father and son, elder brother and younger be determined, nor can majesty and dignity be shown at court, nor official duties carried out, nor offerings to spiritual beings be presented without the rules of propriety. Respect and reverence is what makes humans different from beasts. The rules of propriety value reciprocity. Propriety is seen in humbling oneself and honoring others. In the chapter on the evolution of propriety, Confucius recalls the grand unity when a public and common spirit ruled everywhere. Those with talents, virtue, and ability were chosen. Words were sincere, and harmony was cultivated. People did not only love their parents or sons, but everyone's. The aged were provided with security until death, the able-bodied with employment, and the young with the means of growing up. Kindness and compassion were shown to widows, orphans, and the disabled. Men had proper work, and women had their homes. Selfish schemings found no development, and stealing did not show itself. When this grand union fell into disuse, the kingdom became hereditary, and now everyone loves their own parents and cherishes their own children, working for their own advantage. The rules of propriety were used by great men of power and position to drive away rulers who did not follow them, having recourse to arms. In this less spontaneously good age, ancient kings used the rules of propriety to represent the ways of heaven and regulate human feelings. The seven feelings are joy, anger, sadness, fear, love, disliking, and liking. The ten virtues that are right are kindness of the father and filial duty of the son, gentleness of the older brother and obedience of the younger, justice of the husband and submission of the wife, kindness of elders and deference of juniors, benevolence of the ruler and loyalty of the minister. 
Truthfulness in speech and cultivation of harmony is called advantageous, while quarrels, plundering, and murder are disastrous. The philosopher-scholar who helped to bring about the triumph of Confucianism in the Han Dynasty was Deng Zhengshu, who lived in the second century BC. Deng Zhengshu wanted to unify the empire culturally by teaching the Confucian classics. In 136 BC, he urged Emperor Wu to open an imperial university for the study of the five traditional classics, documents, odes, changes, rites, and spring and autumn annals. His own book, Luxurious Gems of the Spring and Autumn Annals, integrates the currently popular yin-yang cosmology with Confucian philosophy. Deng Chengshu treated the universe as an organic whole in which heaven, earth, and humans all influence each other. He would subject the people to the ruler and the ruler to heaven. Deng Chengshu believed that heaven's will could be discerned by correlating catastrophes and anomalies with warnings in one's heart. This philosophy led to a more superstitious attitude towards such things as eclipses and weather patterns. Deng Chengshu believed that humans are the only creatures capable of practicing goodness and justice, but they can also be greedy. For Deng, one must rectify oneself to be just and love others to be good. Love needs the discrimination of wisdom and wisdom needs love to be translated into action. Deng Chengshu taught that the good person loves people, harmonizes likes and dislikes in human relations, does not harbor hatred or desire to hurt, does not conceal or evade, is not jealous, does not let desires lead to sadness or worry, and does not do anything treacherous, cunning, or depraved. Confucius and his followers, in my opinion, offered a marvelous ethical philosophy in warring and chaotic times that mostly ignored their advice. Although sexist and patriarchal as their times, the universal ethical values and methods of attaining them are well thought out and available to everyone. The detailed regulations of the rules of propriety could become rigid and tyrannical to free expression if they are slavishly followed and the emphasis on the traditions of past heroes and excessive respect for elders could also lead to a rigid social culture dominated by tradition and the older generation. Yet this tendency was already in Chinese culture before Confucius, whose ethical principles at least provided an opportunity to moderate such dominance. The Confucian influence in Chinese culture was to be immense, but how it was practiced in the coming centuries still needs to be examined. I, I like Confucius and the, and the other Confucian philosophers because I think their philosophy is timeless and, and very relevant to our own times. And I did my doctoral dissertation on Confucius because I think his manner of teaching, which, is, which you can see in the Analects because they are dialogues. It's not just his own writing expounding his ideas. You actually see him in, in action. You can see how he taught people in an individualistic way. And to me, um, in that by question and answer and conversation and so on. And, uh, and I think that we can learn great things from Confucius. And it's kind of ironic because Chinese culture turned away from it, after being dominated for so long by it, turned away from it towards communism. And I would hope that you know, in this time period, as they're liberalizing and, and opening up to things, that uh, these teachings, and I'm sure they're there. You know, and then the rest of the world, I think, can learn greatly from Confucius too, because as far as ethics goes, he's right at the top of the list, and as I consider it, Socrates, Confucius, Jesus, you know, are the, probably the greatest ethical teachers that I know of.